Now tonight, I want to deal with the subject. A lot of people say, well, this doesn't apply to our church. I've even had some pastors, you know, say, well, my church isn't going through anything like this. I know some who are. And I don't want to be ugly, but I, a lot of these are younger pastors. I usually will say, well, you just don't know about it, <laughs> you know. And when you see what I'm about to say, it happens everywhere. And I'm talking about conflict. Now, I heard a story about a man. He had been stranded on an island for years. And one of these big vessels went by that couldn't get up because of shallow water and rocks and all, but they'd seen that the man needed to be rescued. So they contacted the Navy. And the Navy was able to get in with the boat that could get in. And the Naval officer, when he was talking to the man as they had rescued him, he said, you know, I noticed that you have three huts uh, or buildings that you have here. And he, the, the naval officer said, I think that, that's probably your house, wasn't he? He said, yeah, that was my house. And he said, well, this looks like a church over here because it looks like you have a steeple. And he said, but I'm curious because you have a, another building on the other side with the steeple and it looks like that's a church. And he says, you know, why did you have two churches? And the man said, the first one had a split. Now think about that. He was stranded by himself on that island. That's to make a point, folks. Um, you got one person. Usually you can get along with yourself, but you get two or more people, there's the potential for conflict. It happened in the early days of the church. Right after Christ had ascended to heaven, and we read about one of the conflicts in chapter 6 of Acts, beginning with verse 1. In those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied... There arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. The Greek widows thought that the Hebrew widows were being treated better when it came to mealtime. <laughs> Boy, you don't ever want to get in you know, argument about food, do you? Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples and to them, and they said, it's not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look out from among you for seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer in the ministry of the word. And believe me, if this is the way church is operated, the pastors and the ministers weren't having to spend so much time in conflict and petty matters a lot of time, and really doing a lot of the ministry of the church, and they devoted themselves to praying and preparing sermons and preaching and teaching the Word. I believe we'd see revival across this country. In verse 4, they, of course, they said, we'll give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the Word. And here's a miracle. The saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they sent before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. And the word of God increased, and the number of disciples multiplied. Now, I'm going to make a statement here that will be hard for some people to accept. But I've been a Christian since I was 10. I'm 66. One of the first business meetings I ever sat in was a conflict over changing the name of a church, Central Avenue Baptist Church on Central Avenue. They had moved there years earlier because their church burned down when it was on Central Avenue. And so it had been at Southern Avenue. And I won't go into the details of why the new pastor who came in and, you know, did what really should have been done earlier. They changed the name to Southern Avenue Baptist Church. But man, there were people who were there to vote it down. How dare you change the name of our church? It's always been Central Avenue Baptist Church, even though we're located at 3084 Southern Avenue. You know, most of the conflicts in churches are pitiful today that happen, that nothing spiritual about them. But here's the first statement I want to make. When it comes to conflict in the church, how to get through it, it's because of this. You cannot avoid it. There's going to be conflict in some way. You get two people together, they're going to eventually not agree on something. 
You see where more than one person is involved, there's the potential for conflict. And get this, maybe the greatest church staff in the history of Christianity had to deal with conflict. That's in Acts chapter 6. You had all the disciples. Judas had committed suicide. He wasn't there anymore. But you had all the disciples who had been there with Jesus, plus the new one they had chosen. I call them the ministerial staff. Any one of them could have preached. Peter was mainly the spokesman then. But that probably was the greatest ministerial staff in the history of Christianity, and they had a conflict in their church. Most likely in your church, if you're not in a conflict right now, you're coming out of one, you're about to go into one. That doesn't mean it's always wrong or something you can't handle. You've got to handle it or your church will begin to suffer because of it. Even the disciples of the Lord experience discord with one another, one time arguing over which of them was the greatest. <laughs> and then, of course, Jesus suffered a major disturbance in his life because of Judas. There were other times I know the Lord had to take it to his many times of prayer when he spent with the Father. I know it was because of things he was asking God to help him deal with, the conflict that he had with the Pharisees and the Sadducees constantly. So you cannot avoid conflict. If you're one of those, well, my church doesn't have conflict, go talk to some pastors from other churches because they probably heard <laughs> themselves what might be going on in your church that you have no clue about. You see, you cannot avoid it, but one thing I like about this the miracle of being in one accord is possible, but as unlikely as a blind person receiving their eyesight or someone being raised from the dead. Hey, it happened in the day of Jesus, it can't happen. But most likely, even getting a church in one accord is something you won't ever find. It did happen on one occasion, and to me this is a miracle when it says, the saying pleased the whole multitude. I used to hear this phrase that said, you can please some of the people all the time, all of the people some of the time, but you can't please all the people all the time. I say it a different way now because of my experiences in the 30 plus years, 35 years I've been in ministry. It's this, you can please some of the people most of the time. You can please most of the people some of the time, but from my experience, you can't please all the people at any time. I guess if there's one thing to me as a pastor and minister that's been disappointing is people who get at conflict with you. I, I can say this honestly today. I have never purposely, as a minister, as a pastor, tried to lead a church to do something that I did not think was the will of God. I've never tried to lead a church or make a decision based off what I wanted. I've always tried to do what I believe was best for the church, but most of all what the Lord wanted us to do. Yet people, they'll come up with all sorts of things. I had a lady at a church years ago because I had to deal with the situation of immorality in the church. I mean, I was legally, I had to deal with it civilly. If I hadn't, I could have gotten in trouble. But that woman said that I was used as a tool of Satan. I mean, it's amazing what people will come up with. So you, there's never a time you can please everybody. I, I wish I could remember where I, what conference I got it at, but it says in the average church, 16% of the people will not change, 84% will. Now, as a pastor, who am I going to spend my time with? Who should I spend my time with? The 84% who want to move forward, but the 16% think you ought to give in and, and do everything they want, and boy, they can make life miserable. But I tell you what, folks, you just can't ever all be in one accord. So what do you do? Conflict in the church. You cannot avoid it, but how do you get through it? Well, first of all, you must approach it biblically, and as it's clearly laid out in the Bible, and you got to keep your personal preferences or opinions out of it. Here, they had the spiritual leaders. But all of a sudden, the spiritual leaders were having to get in this conflict over food. And that's why they said, we're not here to try to serve tables and make sure everybody's treated fairly. That's what other people in the church ought to do. It's taken us away 
from our time to pray and prepare sermons and minister the Word. So you had your leaders. So the people did listen to the leaders when they said, choose from among you right now. That was the number they needed. It doesn't mean this has to be the way. Every time in a church, I know churches, I believe this is where deacons were started. I've been in a church that had 12 deacons because there were 12 disciples when they could have used more deacons. I've been at churches with 30 plus. You know, I mean, that's up to you how many deacons you think you need. But here they chose seven. I have read that those names that I read of the seven men who were chosen were Greek names. That was pretty smart. The people chose some Greek men whom the Grecian widows would have listened to and they kind of took care of that situation. The saying pleased the whole multitude. And so there, another key though, the ministers did appoint them. And the people nominated and recommended who they thought would be good, the ministers made sure they were, and then they went through with it. You see, the way that a church ought to approach conflict is through the Matthew 18 principle. Won't read it again tonight for time's sake, but the Matthew 18 principle is laid out in the gospel, 18th chapter of Matthew through Jesus and it's the biblical plan for handling it. First of all, you got conflict with someone, you ought to go to them out of courtesy and the right Christian attitude, you go to that person you're at conflict with. I really believe 90%, maybe more, of all the discord and things that lead to that in the church would cease if Christians would be Christians and talk to one another face to face. That would take care of it. But so often, instead of doing that, people go to step two and they start telling everybody else. They get a group of people on their side and then it gets out and on. There's where you got conflict. And sometimes it can get resolved, but a lot of times the two people who are at conflict get it resolved, but the others are still taking up for them, and they get involved in all that, and it can become a mess. So most conflicts, though, are sometimes the result of misinformation or miscommunication. And whether that's the case or not, Christians talking to one another face-to-face, privately, often takes care of it. And then before it's taken to the streets is what I call it, the hallways of the church. The biblical way is for the ones at odds, again, to meet face to face. Most of the conflict I've seen in churches is when people haven't talked it face to face and they get to that next level. And then you get people hearing one side of the story. They have one eye seeing, one ear hearing, and they hear one side and then they don't ever hear the other side. And sometimes when they do, boy, are they ever embarrassed by some of their reactions for what they've done. But the spiritual leaders are to find out all sides of the conflict. I'm just like every other pastor. I tell my folks sometimes, I don't have the luxury of just hearing one side of the story, the one I want to hear. I have to hear the other side. But I said, I have to find the third side. That's God's side. That's the main side. And any time we have a decision or conflict in the church, the pastor is mandated by the Word of God that he is to side with God and lead the church to do that no matter how many people feel one way or the other. The majority opinion is not what determines the outcome, but it's getting the mind of Christ and going with it. You know, no matter though how right a plan for resolving conflict may be presented by spiritual leaders, if the people are not supportive of it and some of the leaders cavil in, get ready for one of the ugliest situations you will ever be a part of. Let me tell you, ministers, deacons, in a conflict in the church, you have got to stay together. If one of you gives in, to the other group in some way, you got conflict in your church. And it doesn't matter if sometimes you have the votes where you can, can win any vote that you have, you've still had conflict and it will be a mess in your church. Again, it's not a matter of your side or their side. If you know your own God's side, I can tell you this, you'll be able to feel a sense of peace even in the midst of a raging 
storm and its after effects. That peace that passes all understanding. So, we've said about conflict, you cannot avoid it. You can be in one accord, but that's very unlikely. You must approach it biblically, clearly spelled out in the Bible because of the Matthew 18 principle. And here's the whole key of everything. Get over it. Get over it as much as possible. Move on beyond it and become better because of it. I have personally experienced uh, in a church where I was, uh, my home church later got on church staff. We, I love people I work with, but it divided the staff in some of the things that happened. But I can tell you from watching that, it took 10 years for it to come full circle. By the time everybody had said stuff to somebody, whatever, and they didn't want to see somebody, didn't want to admit it, or whatever, but eventually, over time, it seems like everybody kind of came back together. Yes, you can come back together, but I can tell you this, things will never quite be the same once conflict has done its damage. But a church that has gone through a split can recover to some degree. I've never seen a church where they've had a big conflict that has caused division and people leave that eventually come back and become a stronger church. It just destroys a church even if there are people who are right in what they've done. All oh, folks try to avoid this. But you can't avoid it. Just get through it the right way. No one wins in a church conflict. So don't gloat if you feel you got what you wanted. That's, that's even worse. There's, some, there's something worse than a poor loser. That's a poor winner. And if you get your way, don't go about gloating. Well, we were on the side of God. I mean, maybe you were, but you don't have to gloat about it. The thing you ought to do is focus on doing all to God's glory. That's what we're all about anyway. It's not what I want. Someone said, when people demand their rights, you have rebellion. When people accept their responsibilities, you have revival. <laughs> We need revival in our churches today. We need people to get beyond the petty issues that have divided and even destroyed churches today. But folks, that's a simple message. The example of it is taken right out of the scripture there on how to get through conflict. I have to admit, you know, in the times that I've had to deal with it in my own life, that's the one thing I have to keep focusing on. Focus on what you have. Focus on what you have to be grateful for. And then get over it. There are some things you can't go back and completely fix or have them the way they were before. Just get over it and move on beyond it. Don't become bitter because of it. Become better. And then examine your own heart. Are you doing the things you ought to do as a Christian? If every Christian was like me, would... People be saved. Maybe you're watching this program. You're not sure you're saved. Well, I can tell you, the Bible says that if we confess our sins, that if we admit we're sinners, believe that Jesus died for our sins, we've all sinned, and you believe in your heart that Jesus died for your sins and you trust in Him and live for Him, you'll be saved. And I pray that you know, you know that you know that you're saved. If you'd like more information about it, just contact me at a fresh start at drbobbymullins.com and I'll get information to you on how you can know that you're saved. But I mean, just right now, you can, wherever you are, you can ask Christ to come into your heart. Repent of your sins. Ask Him to be your Lord and Savior. And then make it a point from this point on in your life to live for the Lord. Well, I've been able to do this television program since November 2009. It's aired over 14, well, 1,500 times now. And there's a way that I usually close out this broadcast. And I pray everyone who's watching tonight can say it with me. Thanks be to you, O God, who gives us the victory through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.